Hey friends, this is Amy, the First Lady of the Arn Anderson Fan Club, coming to you live tonight. Yes, you do see three boxes, but one of them is not Justin, who's usually here with us. But let, let's start with the face that does look familiar to you. That is the man, the myth, the legend, survived a bullet and counted Ric Flair's last match. It is our beloved Pondwater Dave. How are you doing tonight, Dave? Doing great, Amy. We're just excited to be here. Um, our guest tonight, you know, if you, you, you would remember him as the, the referee. If you ever saw Von Eric in the ring, you saw him in there with him. Um, he was the referee for World Class Championship Wrestling, and that's what a lot of y'all remember him as. But you're going to learn tonight that he was so much more. Uh, through an and I mean, it, he's got an incredible story. He was uh, booking. He did a lot of things behind the scenes for World Class Championship Wrestling, and we're proud to have him here tonight, Mr. David Manning. Yay! Well, thanks, Dave. Thank Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome to the show. We can't thank you enough for being here tonight. Uh, your story is pretty unique, and I think one of my favorite things about it is that I remember hearing that you were coaching wrestling, high school wrestling. And through a random act of kindness that you just called Kerry Von Eric over to the side to give him some pointers, that puts you on Fritz's radar. And that that was kind of your entry to into this fantastic life you've lived. Am yeah, I actually, I was coaching at the high school, but I was also coaching for free over at the YMCA with uh, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And so uh, it was actually, that's how young Kerry was when I first met him. Uh, one of my boys wrestled him at a tournament out in uh, Denton. And so after the match, I didn't know it was Kerry Von Eric. I just, I didn't even know what his name was. And he was doing a, he was trying to do a switch wrong and a couple of things. And so after the match, I just took him out on the mat and said, Hey, let me show you something. And I was showing him a few pointers and uh, lo and behold, uh, I didn't know his dad, Fritz Von Eric was in the audience and, I get a call two or three weeks later saying, Hey, I want you to come out to my house. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm his private coach. And then I'm a second at the ring. And then uh, I became the youngest referee ever. And then uh, next thing I know, I'm in booking meeting. I did everything just about but sell wrestling tickets. Uh, well, it's incredible yeah, that I that know. happened. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, you know, just calling a kid over to the side, even though he wasn't one of your kids that to help. I mean, that's what coaches do is they help out. And, and for well, him to, for him I to say, you know, you give good things out, you get good things back. And I get, I gave something out. Not even matter of fact, when, when I went to meet with Fritz, he said, you remember the kid you helped here in Denton? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he yells, Carrie. And Carrie walks in and he goes, there's the kid you help. I want you to be his private coach. So, Mr. And, uh, Manning, were you, um, did you know who Fritz Von Eric was at the time? Like, when, oh, he, yeah. It, so, you did know that. Did you watch wrestling? Were you aware of kind of what was going on? Yeah, it was crazy. I went because, because how I found out Fritz was behind, I, I still didn't know the connection with him and the boy. I went to the concession stand to get something to drink and a, a sandwich, and they gave it to me, and they were like, it's on the house. And I said, oh, coaches eat free, huh? And she goes, the girl goes, no, but you do a uh, compliments <laughs> of Fritz von Eric. And I, I was like, Fritz von Eric's here. Cause I watched every Saturday night, you know? And, uh, she said, well, he was. And he said, if you wanted something to eat or drink, put it on his tab. And so, uh, I couldn't figure out why, but then a couple of weeks later, I get a call from another coach that says, Hey, Jack Atkinson is trying to reach you. And I'm like, who's Jack Atkinson. And the guy's like, it's Fritz von Eric. And I said, well, I'll give him my number. And next thing you know, I'm on the phone with Fritz von Eric. And so did he, so did your coach friend ruin that for you? Like Fritz von Eric is not really Fritz von Eric. His name is Jack. <laughs> yep. Oh. I was actually shocked. I didn't know the real name, but <laughs> I know one thing, whenever he came to me and he said, you want to make some extra money just carrying, I, I started out just carrying ring robes to and from the ring, mm -hmm. you know, as a second. And, uh, Loved it. And then all of a sudden, uh, probably I did that for about three months and I had a beard back then and he comes to me and he goes, uh, cut that beard. I got an idea. 
Because back then, you know, all of the referees were retired wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And so he goes, uh, you cut that beard, we're going to promote you as the youngest referee in history. And uh, so I came in the following, matter of fact, I, I did my first match. Yep, there, that was a few years later. <laughs> I, that picture there was taken at the Cotton Bowl. And, uh, but yeah, we, uh, man, it was just crazy the way everything fell in place. And then I just, I don't know what it was. I had a natural act for finishes and, you know, just figuring out, you know, how to do angles and stuff. So you were an amateur wrestler. You were coaching amateur wrestling. Did you do that as a child in, in I, high school? Did I did. I started wrestling when I was about seven or eight years old, uh, wrestled all the way up. And actually in Texas, wrestling was not a, a uh, sponsored certified UIL sport. So literally when I was in the eighth grade, uh, there was the UIL was not behind it. UIL, you know, you can only wrestle four years in high school. Mm -hmm. Well, in the eighth grade, I challenged for the high school team at MacArthur and won. And so I went and represented MacArthur High School in state as an eighth grader and one state as an eighth grader, uh, which can never be done again. So uh, that that's that's pretty neat thing to fame. So I, I may be the only five time state finalist walking around, but um, it, it was, uh, you know, I was always pretty I was I was good. And that's kind of what gave me the break in there. The, Texas didn't have a lot of good coaching, uh -huh. you know, because matter of fact, when I wrestled, I had to go to Oklahoma, Kansas to get good competition. And so um, we were on the road every weekend going to tournaments all over. And um, so whenever I got out, I was lucky enough to have a guy that was coaching for free at the Y, and that's how I learned how to wrestle. So I went back, was giving back there in a way. And then the high school called me. I didn't, I was, an, I, I, back then you couldn't have your scholarship and be married and, oh. and make it work. So I came home and, and, and got married. And uh, the high school called me, even though I didn't have a degree, they paid me to coach the high school wrestling team. See, I, I was in the I was in the Dallas Independent School District, and we just didn't have wrestling. Exactly, it wasn't an option for us. Exactly. Well, when I first got in it, we literally had to uh, uh, we sold uh, uh, Christmas trees at the Christmas tree lot every year. You know, we had to raise our own money. Basically, it was like soccer back then. Soccer was not a UIL sport in the state of Texas, and so they they had to do their own fundraisers and stuff. That's how you raised your money to get around and go to events. Well, while we were talking about Fritz, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about him because, you know, the Iron Claw movie's coming out, and the trailer, the trailer has not painted Fritz in a, in a good light at all. I'm, and I, I wanted you to take a minute to tell us, tell us about the man because, I think, that trailer's given him a bad rap, and I don't know how the movie's. I hadn't seen the movie yet, so I don't know how the movie's going to portray him. Uh. I don't think he's the villain. No, I don't really think he's the villain that he's being portrayed and had historically has been portrayed to be. I think it's a generational thing that, that a lot of the young people today don't understand. Well, the, the movie, uh, and I, you know, I was at the premiere and, um, I wish they would have talked to us. It's crazy. There's two people alive that lived it. A lot of people tell the story. I was Kevin. And I lived it. And, um, it was hard for me to, to sit through the movie because I know all the little details and the truths and the, so I, so I saw everything coming from me watching. I saw everything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest things was the way they portrayed Fritz and the way they portrayed that there was a Vonerick curse. You're going to see there was never a curse. There was never even talk of a curse, but the thing is Fritz one, he was a phenomenal business person Two, very strong Christian and believe it or not, uh, and I'll use Carrie as an example, because you see that in the trailer where he's telling Carrie, it's time for you to get in the ring. He wanted Carrie to finish college at the University of Houston. He was adamant about it. Obviously, Carrie saw what the, the, the girls and the fame and the, everything going on with Dave and, and, and Kev, he wanted in the ring. And... Um, Brian Adias and I were talking about this last weekend. Brian comes down and hunts on my property. I got about 1,500 acres down there on Big Cypress River. And uh, so Brian and I were talking about it. 
Fritz was adamant that Kerry, you need to finish school. Well, Kerry had a chance to possibly be in the Olympics the year Jimmy Carter boycotted the Olympics. And so when that happened, Kerry said, Dad, I want the ring. And he basically said, I'm not going back to school. I want the ring. And so we started training him. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously it was the right move for him. Um, man. Uh, he, he clicked and, and then we had three Von Eriks and it was, you know, everybody asked me, well, how can they be over so big when there's, and I think it's because the people here looked at them as if they were their kids. They saw them grow up. They saw them if they won a trophy in football. They saw them if Dave scored the highest points in basketball. They heard about it if, if Kerry ran for 200 yards, you know. So uh, I think the way Fritz built them up as they grew up, they were a household name. So I don't think anybody, I tell my friends all the time what it was like that they, they were rock stars. The whole, I mean, everybody from 80, once it blew up at the end of 82, when they slammed that cage door on David's head, I mean, on Kerry's head, it blew up. And it was, and it was that way from the top of the card to the bottom of the card. Yeah, And I don't think people understand just how strong world class was from top to bottom because sure you had the Von Erichs and the Freebirds on top, but then you had the Iceman and Akbar, and then you had Chris Adams and Jimmy Garvin and Brody. Yes. And then Brody would come in and, and it was just, you, you know, you had Brody. Uh, no, people don't understand. You had Brian Adias. You had, uh, uh, I mean, it was crazy, and and we still had the run. We were coming off the run. We got our first big run with Kabuki, and and um, uh, and 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 then you know we created Bundy, uh, King Kong Bundy, and um, so it was um, ravishing Rick Rude. I mean, the talent we had, uh, it was crazy, and and they were all making money, you know, because. Be, being, you know, Dallas was hard because if you were a baby face, especially there's only room for so many main eventers, as you know. And so we got three Von Erichs that are going to be somewhere in the main event. And uh, so so if you were undercard like a Chris Adams or an Iceman, it pretty much meant you were the undercard, you know. And uh, now if you were a heel, man, this was the place to be. It was just. Like I said, you get there, and there was there was so much going on that it wasn't just we're going to watch four matches to get to what we came to see. Everything. I mean, they they could take an opening bout. To this day, I still remember Johnny Mandel, Johnny Mantell, and Chris Adams going to a ten minute time limit draw, and the crowd wanting five more minutes, and they both were baby faces, good guys. Yep. They were both good guys and got that reaction. And normally you can't put two good guys in the ring and, and make it. I mean, it takes a lot of talent to make that work. People just don't buy into it. The other one, Gino. We had Gino Hernandez. You know, when Gino and Chris teamed up, uh, when, when we flipped Chris, you know, to Hill, man, that was a big draw. Matter of fact, that picture you just saw me at the Cotton Bowl. That, that was, was the night match, I refereed Gino and Chris in the hair match with uh, Kevin and Kerry. Oh, yeah. That's when they shave their heads, right? They hold oh, yeah. them down yep. and all of them come out. <laughs> uh, Mr. Manning, on, um, just to kind of help me on a timeline, because I know you said you started off um, helping out. You know, just he asked if you wanted to make some extra money. When did you go kind of full time and then multiple jobs at that time? I, I would say probably I refereed for about a little over a year. And uh, I was also at that point, I'd quit my regular job and I was working down at the sportatorium. I would help out. I guess I did sell tickets because I helped out Ed Watt <laughs> on, on Tuesdays, you know, the day of the show back then it was on Tuesday. So I would help out on that day or doing whatever at the sportatorium. And um, they did their booking meetings on Tuesday morning. And so one Tuesday morning, Fritz came in. And I was sitting in uh, Ed's office and all of a sudden he was like, Hey kid, I want you upstairs today. And I said, uh, upstairs. And he said, I want you in the booking meeting. And I said, okay. And so we go to the, 
We go to the bookie meeting, and I'll never forget, it was uh, Bronco in a chair. Um, it was, uh, let's say it was Bronco, um, Gary Hart, Bulldog Danny Pletches, and then I was sitting off in a chair off to the side, uh, just sitting there. And so they were discussing things. And, and Fritz was a guy that sometimes he would have two cigarettes going, <laughs> you know. And so Fritz, they had they they had an angle and they were going through this angle. And Fritz was laying it all out. And he looks around and he says, what do you think, Bronk? And Bronk says, I like it. And he says, uh, what do you think, Pletch? Pletch says, I like it. And he says, what do you think, Gary? And Gary says, I like it. And out of the blue, he turns and looks at me and says, what do you think, kid? I said, I don't like it. And he says, well, first of all, you're effing fired. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me why you don't like it. And I, I don't even remember what the angle was, but I said something. And he was puffing on that cigarette. And all of a sudden he goes, um, you know what? The kid's right. And he changed it up a little bit. So when we went to leave the room, he said, uh, I want you to stay here. And they all left. And he said, you know, I could have said I was going to go take a big dump in the ring. And they'd all said they liked it. And he said, uh, I want your honest opinion every time, and I want you in every booking meeting moving forward. And so as I said in the booking meetings, at first I was quiet, but then I started coming up with angles and uh, finishes. Even when Ken took over, you know, um, Ken was a, was a guy that could hear a finish and then add to it, but he wasn't good at coming up to finish. So I did all the finishes. Uh, I, I, the cage thing was my idea. Uh, it worked. We, the door, <laughs> slamming the door. Yeah, it worked all right. You know, it was really scary doing that because the the cage, you know, that, that door has a like a U-shaped deal that folds down like this. And then we would put a lock on it. Uh, it had a place to put a lock. So when we came up with the idea of slamming the cage door on Carrie's head, the biggest fear was how do we slam it without killing him? And so we told Gordy, you got to make sure the latch is down. Okay. So that when it slams, that latch is going to hit the, you know, it's going to hit the post first. Well, we never realized how hard Gordy was going to slam that door. And he slammed it so hard, it bent the, the deal was just, you know, fastened by bolts. It shifted. And so that's where Kerry really took, I thought it knocked him out. And so I immediately went to him and I was like, can you hear me? <laughs> and uh, uh, he was getting color and uh, he hadn't got it yet. So I was like, okay, do I need to do this? And he was like, he was in La La Land, but he came around and we were able to finish it. But it wouldn't have mattered if he came around or not, man. After that thing closed, holy smanoli, we, we, we thought we were going to have a riot. Um, it, it was crazy. Uh, it I was. Rick said, I'm just getting behind you. Go. <laughs> he got right <laughs> behind me and out we went. That crowd, the crowds were always vicious. I mean, you can even go back and you can watch um, David Von Erich and Terry Gordy in a handcuff match. And there was a fan that when they were beating David at the, at the end of the match, they took, you, you took David's handcuff, handcuff off first. So Michael gets it and handcuffs David to the ropes and they're just, they're beating on him and the fans are coming and we didn't have guardrails. They were just, just a rope. It was yep. just a rope. And uh, you can actually watch that, that match. And there's a fan that made it in the ring and he's just standing there. Cause I think he didn't think he was going to make it that far. And he got in there and he was like, now what do I do? And then finally, I think Gordy got him out of there, but which well, we had, we had one, one night. Uh, you remember when buddy was wearing the red head gear? Yes, sir. Um, uh, I forget who he was. It was Iceman and him. And he had, he threw something in, in his eyes. And then I didn't see the fan come from the back and he comes in the ring. Actually it was a tag cause Kevin was there. Well, you know, the baby faces can't hit the fans. And so before you know it, the guy just came and leaped up on buddy's back. And so when that happens, you know, you, you're, you've been there. It, it's really us that takes care of it. So I remember I was hitting the guy right in the ear and waffled him about four or five times and knocked him off Buddy. And uh, I remember we got the back. Kev was like, God, I wanted to hit him so bad. <laughs> <laughs>
He said, you get to have all the fun. (laughs) And I I talk about the heat all the time. I told him, we even talked about it last week, that um, my favorite place to sit at the Sportatorium was Section D, Row 5, right under the flag. And the reason I did that is because, for one, I could stand up and see over everybody's heads because they wouldn't sit down. But the heat would get out of control, and when they started throwing beers and drinks, there was nobody behind me, so I didn't I didn't go home smell like beer and have to try to convince my parents I wasn't out drinking. Well, plus if they went out the door, they went out right there at that door right to the left of you. <laughs> oh yeah, they did. When you you knew it, you knew it was vicious when they when they went out the side door. You know, we had it it was worse in Corpus. In Corpus, uh Joe Blanchard was the promoter down there, and uh we we wrestled in this in the in the shoreline coliseum. And so when the matches were over. Uh, the baby faces would go out this way. There was a stage and, and back in the back with curtains and everything. Well, the, the baby face would go up that side and then cross over behind. And we would go, I would always go out with the hills because of the confrontation they were going to get. And we had told Joe it was out of hand. You got to get it fixed. Well, one night, um, El Diablo, the two, uh, the, the two mask Mexican wrestlers were here and, and they got real big heat on Jose Lothario and uh, and and we started out of the ring, and literally you had to fight. I mean, physically fight to get through those seven rows of ringside. And so we're we're fighting and pushing and shoving. Well, one of them, I don't know what, exactly what happened. They broke and went into the crowd. And when he went in the crowd, I tried to go in and after him say, "No, don't go." And um, as we went in, all of a sudden I hear, "Oh, I'm." They stabbed me. And mm. so I was like, crap. And so I grabbed him <laughs> and we come and I'm motioning into the back. And a lot of the boys, even the baby faces, came out and helped us get out of there. Well, I thought they were going to beat Joe Blanchard's butt that night. Uh, they were so mad. And when we got to the back, uh, he was lucky. You know, he was a big guy. And they said he probably got stuck with a, about a four inch blade. So he was big enough that it didn't really penetrate anything major, but they said if they would have stuck me, it would have probably killed me. Oh, um, you know, because I was about 185 pounds and, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it could get scary if you let it get out of hand. There was, I was going to ask you what was your scariest moment, but I'm pretty sure you just told us. So never yeah. mind. <laughs> that was, uh, I, you know, I, I, I could see, where that is probably the most dangerous part of the whole operation, the match coming out or going back, because all you have to do is just, you know, I mean, it wasn't like people were getting wanded when they come in. There's no telling what people had in their pockets or, you know, bring it in with them. Well, I'll tell you a story. Fritz von Erich told a story. He was in Japan, wrestled a match. And, you know, back then Fritz was the ultimate hill. And uh, when the match was over, he, he, he went out of the ring and was going to stomp back to the bathroom. And a guy took a big pin and stabbed him right. Luckily, it missed his spine, but Jesus. drove it in his neck about uh, an inch and a half right in the center of his neck. And he wasn't sure what had happened, but luckily it missed the spine and they got to the back and they just pulled it out, you know. But, yeah, it like you said, you don't ever know what they're carrying, but I mean, hey, a big pin. <laughs> yeah, and what force that person yeah. had to do to like wedge that, and oh my goodness, that's the downside when they believe. But there's nothing better. <laughs> there's nothing better when they're than there's nothing better than when they're completely bought in. But I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine doing what we do today back then. I mean, it was just incredible. Now, when you were out, everybody loved you. Well, we knew we knew we knew we knew our guys were going to get a fair shake when you were in because you were going to catch them. Now, when well, Bronco was there, when Bronco was in the ring, we're like, oh, no. <laughs> there was a there was a few calls they didn't like. <laughs> but, you know, y'all were innovative. Y'all were very innovative. I noticed uh, I started my first time to actually go into a match was um, Star Wars 82. Uh, the two out of three falls with um, Kerry and Flair where Fritz came out and jumped on the referee. I think it was Larry Hayes. Fritz got mad at the ref and you were pleading with him because I guess you, the ref took a bump 
because Kerry Discus punched him. You finished the fall. And then they disqualified Kerry for, for hitting the ref. But that was my first exposure to wrestling at all. I mean, actually at going, because, I mean, I watched it as a little kid when Ivan Putsky was there. But my brother drew, drew um, kind of drew me in that, the, that Saturday night before. But I'd go back and watch, and y'all had two referees in the ring for tag matches. Um, uh, I've even asked you about this before, that you got to a 10-minute time limit draw or 15 minute time limit draw and you picked the winner of the match. You yep. actually judged the match and, and picked a winner because it was Captain Frank Dusick. And I knew you had a you had a program with with Captain Frank. That's why I was asking you if it was an angle yep. to, to piss him off even further against you. It was. Because you just never you just never saw the it was referee always a draw. decide the winner. Uh yeah, just, they they uh what well, you know when you talk about innovative, we we once we made the move to world class and we had channel 39, we started music to the ring. We started uh, cameras at the ring. You know, when I first got started there in Fort Worth, there was two cameras. One was stationary. It didn't even have anybody behind it. The other one was, it was basically stationary, but you had a guy that would film coming to the ring. And uh, so we added cameras to the ring we added uh, boom mics at the ring, which was really unheard of because, you know, the boys are calling the match. And uh, and and we would even, they, they were like, can we get on the ring? We basically gave them free reign with the understanding, you better be ready because we don't ever know when someone's going to hit the ropes or, you know. And that was the television station? I mean, that, yeah. they were the ones that were taping all that? They were taping all that, and then and then we added the little vignettes, you know, where we might go film the free birds at a bar, or we we filmed uh, uh, Sunshine and Garvin out at Dave's place cleaning up all the horse poop after they lost, or we would they came to my house and filmed me shooting pool and my tiger back then and uh, all of that kind of stuff, and I think that really separated us because they saw the wrestlers in a different light than in that ring. You had a tiger? I had a tiger. A real tiger, like a, a big old tiger. tiger. How did you get that? I had a big, I got it down in Austin, Texas. And uh, it, it grew, when it got about 120 pounds, I had to get rid of it. It was, it who was easy. Get, who do you get rid of a tiger to? <laughs> well, it's a crazy story. Uh, Ken Mantell knew a guy that said, I got to see how I tell this. Long story short, some okay. people in Mexico wanted the tiger. And I said, well, they can't get it to Mexico. They said, they'll get it to Mexico. And so they showed up at my house. And they were going to give me three free trips to Cancun. <laughs> all expenses, everything uh, for the tiger. And so they did. They showed up. And in this van, they had a bunch of cockatoos. They had all kinds of stuff. Okay. And I said, I don't see how you're going to get it through customs. They said, they won't go through customs. And uh, so the guy had a big restaurant in Mexico that was like wildlife. And so he wanted the tiger. He had a cage, everything. Okay. And uh, well, it turned out it was the cartel. So I never took my trips. I was like, <laughs> Probably best just to let them know, have the we're, tiger. We're, 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 we're long distance friends. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Where did you uh, get your tiger from? I got, I got it down in Austin, Texas. Probably one of the scariest things I've ever been part of. We went there. We didn't know what I was going to get. I, they had exotic animals, so I'm looking at all this stuff. So the Bengal, she was in a cage that was probably 10 foot long by maybe 8 foot wide. And in the middle, they had a, a cage they could drop. So they lured the mom over to one side of the cage Aww. with some meat, and then they dropped that cage down. She knew what was happening. The Cubs were on the other side. And so then we opened the gate on that side and the guy's going in to get her. I'm not kidding you. This 600 pound Bengal tiger is running into the gate of that, that fence with her head trying to tear it open. And I'm like, man, if she breaks that open, we got a whole ass. And the guy goes, if she breaks that open, there ain't no, there ain't nobody running. We're all dead right here. Mm. And, um, uh, yeah, she was she was upset we were taking that cub. And so I took it and um after after she got up about 80 pounds I went and uh Barnum and Bailey was in town. So I literally went to Reunion Arena, drove around back, 
where the tigers were and went and knocked on a trailer. I'd ask where, and I knocked on the trailer and the guy that did the act with all the tigers and everything, let me in. Well, one, he looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, so I told him the whole story and he said, well, let me tell you. And I said, I have two dogs. I had fixed my chain link fence to where if she jumped up and grabbed it, it would collapse. So she couldn't get out. Well, behind me, the guy had a horse ranch and it would really, that smell would freak them out. But I lived in South Lake, so there was no ordinance yet. They couldn't do anything about it. So I talked to him and he said, well, one, you're not feeding her enough. She should be eating six full chickens a day by now. And uh, he said, I'm just going to tell you like it is. You're going to come home one day. You're going to have no dogs. Oh. He said, you're going to come home one day. You're going to have a horse in your backyard. He said, I guarantee you right now, what she do when you go out? I can see her right now jumping up on you, rubbing her face on you. I said, oh, yeah. And he goes, well, one day she's going to knock you down. Then she's going to realize you're not the dominant one. And he said, it's a she. That's the killer. You should have, if you were going to do this dumb move, you should have got a male. They're lazy and they wait for the female to bring the food. <laughs> and, uh, and so he said, you got to get rid of her. He said, I'm just telling you like it is. And uh, especially because I, my son at that time, Sean was about, gosh, uh, he was probably about six, five, six. Mm -hmm. He, no, he was a toddler. Shannon was at the age of, she was about five or six and would come visit and I would see the tiger going down this long window we had watching them. So uh, it was, you know, I got lucky that somebody could take her. Okay. Did your wife her, her sign name was off Sheba. on Sheba? Her name was Sheba. Did your wife sign off on Sheba or did you just show up with Sheba whenever? <laughs> no, I just showed up with Sheba. And uh, <laughs> it was crazy because uh, I'm going to see if I have a. It was oh. crazy because. You, you just don't, you know, and, and I would take her to the sportatorium. Kev took some pictures with her. Matter of fact, that made the, the Japan magazine. But I took her to the sportatorium, and it was funny that um, one day I've got her, and I've got her her little leash. I've got it around one of the desks. And so she would drag that desk around the room. <laughs> and so one day I'm in there, and she's getting real aggressive with me. She's kind of growling and getting aggressive. Well, it turns out Kevin and Carrie were there. We had all got chicken. And so Kev had taken a piece of the chicken and stuck it on my the back of my shirt <laughs> right here. So that tiger could smell it, you know. Oh and she God. was like, she wanted some of that chicken. So she was getting. <laughs> so I'm guessing chicken. that was your tiger. They did the promo picture. Yes, I think it was Carrie did a promo picture with the white tiger. Well, and Lance did one too. You know, Lance had the great big one with the tiger. Well, who knew? But, but now, but once I got rid of her, they changed the, they changed the ordinance out in South Lake. You can't have a tiger. Anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, when we were talking about innovations, the, the same night as that cage match, y'all introduced the world six man tag team championship. And in hindsight, that championship was custom made for the Von Eric Freebird feud. Am I yeah, correct? Was. And I've always said that nobody else has ever done a six man championship that meant anything because no. that was custom made for the perfect three on three versus three. Well, and, and we did that. And, and, and I, and I'll tell you a funny story. When, remember when we did the match? Oh my. Yeah. There's a picture of, of Lance with the, the tiger. That was a big selling picture, by the way, I handled all the souvenirs for the company too. Little Sheba. <laughs> Can you see this? Let me... Who is that? You? Who That's is me that? and my tiger. Oh, well, she was little. Yep. <laughs> Look at her paws, how big they are. Yeah. <laughs> but when we did the six-man match, we came up with the idea. Remember when we did the two-ring battle royal? Yes. So for the first time ever, no one had, we always tried to do stuff no one's done. So we came up with this idea on the bookie meeting. We're going to do a two ring battle royal. You had to throw everybody from one ring out and then they would get in the other ring. And then the last one over and the last one standing in the second ring was the winner. So Fritz was in a match uh, 
uh, I can't remember if it was Bundy or Ox Baker, but he's in a match before the Battle Royal. And so Fritz is in the booking meeting and he says, uh, hey, Dave, you think you think you can take the bump if I throw you from one ring all the way over both ropes into the other ring? Well, I'm just sitting there thinking, OK, over the ropes. Yeah, I can do that. Well, we didn't realize how far it was till we saw the rings up because you got the aprons where the, you know, the guys stand. That's a good three foot. Then you got the other one. Now we're at six foot. Then you got the ropes. And uh, so when I was out looking at the setup, I went back and told Fritz, I said, boy, you need to give me a little extra ump, which was a mistake. <laughs> Because I think I hit in the middle of the other ring <laughs> by the time it was said. Because I remember he grabbed me by the back of the neck, and here we went. And literally, I went like a cartwheel going over the top ropes. And um, But, yeah, so we did that. You know, no one had ever done that. And, and now, let's look at the downside of that. We never thought about if you're in the front row ringside and you're on the other side of that ring, it was not a good seat. Mm -hmm. No. Because you, you got to look through that ring. We would alternate the matches. We would have one in this ring, then we'd have one in this ring, and then one in this ring. But, yeah, if you were on the front row, even though you paid big bucks, I, I remember uh, at, 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 at Texas Stadium show, we had the discussion, could we do $30 a ticket? And then the scalpers came and bought all the tickets up for the ringside first three rows and sold them for 100 bucks. I remember Fritz was livid, you know. <laughs> And I know that doesn't sound like a lot to y'all, but a hundred bucks for a scout ticket was a lot in 1984. Oh, yeah, I paid, it was. I paid a hundred bucks to go uh, to, to go a hundred bucks a ticket to go see Michael Jackson in 1984. <laughs> it was a lot. It was big bucks because normally the ringside seats back then were going for eight bucks, twelve yeah. bucks. Oh yeah, you know. And so to to think you could sell it for a hundred dollars, and we could. Uh, matter of fact, you know that that show right there. I did my best along with Kevin's backing everybody to get Fritz to pay for view. It had been the first pay for view because we had people calling from all over the world wanting to come to that. Mm -hmm. And I just, we just couldn't get him to do it. Uh, when you were talking about um, a, a bump, unique bumps, you took, a, you took a really scary bump one time where they, they threw you into the ropes and you, you got, you hung yourself. You did the hangman spot. And back then the ropes were loose. The, it wasn't like today where they're, you know, nobody's doing it. They weren't doing all the moves off the top rope and needed it that tight. But they, he takes a, he gets hit and he goes over the top rope and he flips over and he's hung. And there's a sense of panic in the arena. Mark Lawrence jumps up immediately. People are up and they just can't move the ropes and let him drop through. They physically pick him up. And lift him up yeah. upside down to get him back in the ring. And he hung there for a minute. Well, what was crazy was, you know, the first time I saw that, I was working as a second. Remember, I told you I started out that way. So I wasn't smart. Red Bastine took that bump. And I'll never forget, I wasn't supposed to eat, get on the ring at all. My instinct, I jumped up to try to help him. Oh. Because I thought he was going to break his neck. And, and, and you're choking and so, the, but the key to that bump is no one can hit the ropes while you're in there because those ropes will tighten like that. And so I, I remember it was Kevin and Kerry against Gino and Chris. And I told Gino and Chris, as soon as I'm tied those ropes, both of you grab a Von Eric. <laughs> and and uh, so, but the thing was, we kept the ropes pretty tight. But that night on that one side, we loosened the ropes a little bit because they, it's, it's, Fritz asked me, could I take the bump? And I didn't know for sure, but I said, I can, I can try it because you can't practice it. How are you going to practice it? And so, um, you literally, it was crazy. We did it in Fort Worth at Will Rogers. And as I hit the ropes, you got to hit the ropes like this and you got to catch them and then propel your legs over and keep that rope around your neck. And it, it literally, it's all you can do to hold it off your carotid arteries, you know? Oh. And so we didn't smart we didn't smarten off. Mark Lawrence up or any of them. And so Mark immediately jumped up. Oh my God. Oh my God. He could die. You can and find uh, it. you can find it and watch Mark Lawrence's reaction. I mean, and that, I'm sure that's why I remember it vividly. We, yeah. I mean, just everybody was concerned and um, 
Sh Shana or Shana Atkins says bump of what? I'm confused. If we're talking about whenever the referee gets knocked That's my down. daughter. I thought so because she was talking about that the, the earlier she commented that the the tiger was beautiful. Yeah, she she uh, that that that's my that's my oldest daughter, uh, and uh, she spent a lot of evenings uh, at the sportatorium. Would come up to Fritz's office, and uh, we, I actually got a great picture of her sitting in my lap in his office. But you know, on that bump, I tell you a funny thing: we shot it in Fort Worth, and then we and we're calling a bump. That's when you when you hit the ring or you go outside the ropes. That's a bump. So when we did that. We had to send that footage, you know, over to Channel 39, and they would edit it into the World Class tape. And it was crazy. So on Tuesdays, we would go over there, and we would do all of our interviews. <laughs> and so on that Tuesday that we go over there that morning to shoot some special interviews, when we walk in, all of the production guys, the edit guys and everything, as I walk into the building – they all lined up and got out on their knees and started doing this. <laughs> and I'm like, and they go, we watched that thing 50 times in slow motion and slow, slow motion to see if you did that on purpose. And when we finally figured out you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just looked like it just looked like an accident and it was something. I yeah. mean, that's, that's one to be proud of. And we've learned over the years, Mick Foley talks about doing that, but the ropes were tighter. And if you're not careful, it'll rip your ear off. No. And you got to pray that the, the wrestlers don't hit the ring. So look, I'm glad to see at least one of my kids made the show. Love you, Shanna. <laughs> uh, she sounds like she might have some good stories. She's saying she maybe had a picture with Carrie also, and she knows about the tiger and she came to the sportatorium. We might have to have you on, that, Sam, if you don't mind. <laughs> you that was, that, but, uh, was that her, the picture of her and Carrie is up in Fritz, Fritz's office. For, Carrie and I was up there. That's when we took that picture. Well, it was so big back then. You're talking about Michael Jackson. I went to the Michael Jackson show, and um, uh, we had great seats, and we had a limo pick us up. It was me, Sunshine, Jimmy Garvin, and uh, if I'm right, and Shannon can respond on this. I know for a fact Tammy and Donna went because – that, that was my two stepdaughters. One of them got their fingers in the door when it closed. <laughs> and luckily, it was cushioned, so it, it didn't do anything. But it was funny. We were driving, and uh, instead of saying, ouch, it's like, hey, my fingers are in the door. <laughs> but um, we went and saw Michael Jackson that night. We At reunion, we were so blessed. We would go from the sportatorium, walk across, same security, so we could go backstage to any concert. And true story, we go backstage, Carrie and I, Rush is there. And we oh. go backstage. Well, you know, he comes out to Modern Day Warrior. We go backstage, and we're standing backstage listening, and they're performing, and they find out, I don't know how or who sent the word up, they find out Carrie's in the building. So they send word back. Now, they're sold out, 18, 19,000 people. They send word back that two songs from them, they're going to do they're going to do Tom Sawyer, when they get to the point where Carrie come out through the curtains. Oh. And so sure enough, here we are at a concert for Rush. And when they started Tom Sawyer, when Carrie came through those curtains, they went berserk. The people did. It was crazy. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that Carrie was more over with the crowd than Rush was. And they paid to see Rush. Yeah. <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. Yeah. I totally believe it. Uh, One of the things you were talking about Mr. Manning about being innovative and all the things they did down there at WCCW. I think your wardrobe was pretty innovative for a ref. You did not see mm. someone, a ref dress like you did, but I thought, I mean, it really did set you apart. What made, was that your decision? You just needed to be comfortable. Like what made you say I'm doing color coordination and I'm doing these kind of things. Well, you know, um, as I said, they promoted me as the youngest, you know, ever. Uh, I was probably the only referee out there that had pictures selling. Oh. And um, um, I um, I hated the, the black and white stripes. And so <laughs> I decided I'm not wearing that. And so I just went and bought some cool stuff and started wearing it. And I remember, if you remember, whenever we did Texas Stadium, I wore a red. It still had the stripe, uh, kind of like, like pinstripe. Oh, yeah. 
but I'd wear stuff that I thought just looked nice and uh, athletic and uh, stuff like that. And a uh, uh, funny story about that cage, I'll have to tell you. But um, we, uh, you know, I, I just wasn't going to be the same old referee in the ring. And so Fritz pretty much gave me a lot of leeway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that, Adidas, that Adidas, yeah. Adidas had a whole set of that where you could get the matching. I mean, the, the shirt and it would have matching pants with the three straps down. So it was perfect for refereeing. And, and they, they don't allow it on the indies by the way, because I tried to show up with the Adidas pants with the three white straps and the promoter told me on a very, on a show that, I mean, it wasn't even a high quality show per se. Uh, don't, don't, don't do that again. Where, 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 where are your slacks? Well, you know, <laughs> see this cage, this was called the penalty box. And so the first time we got ready to do this, Fritz put me in charge of getting the penalty box built. So I built it out of wood. I had it built out of wood. Well, the wrestlers tore that up in about two minutes. So they said, you're not going to build a penalty box we can stay in. You could have went down and shark di- did the shark dive in this, this thing here. This thing was uh, uh, three-quarter inch steel bars. I mean, this was a re- you could have carried prisoners around in this. Uh, when we put them in and locked this door, they weren't getting out. It was a uh, – and you – you uh, all you could do, and it seemed like the Von Erichs always got locked up in the penalty box. So they just had to sit there and watch watch um watch the brother get beat up two on one until until the time period was up. You know, I tell people, uh, and, and Dave, you know this. I tell people if you really don't or if you're a person that doesn't really understand how tough wrestling was in Texas, go back and Google Freebirds versus Von Erichs strap match. Okay. And tell me. You'd like to be in that ring. They, I mean, they beat the hell out of each other with those straps. It was Country crazy. Whipping. It was bad. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, Carrie would, and I. I mean, everybody says that Kevin, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin didn't know how to go soft anyway on anything. No. Hey, no. Uh, a lot of times we only saw you in Dallas as the referee, and if you were on camera, and you were on camera a lot but it was always with official business. Uh, recently, uh, on an episode of the book with Conrad Thompson and David Crockett, they were going through Jimmy Crockett's book. Like, you know, because we've, we've done that. They've done that with you too, with Fritz's planner. Uh, they did, a, they were building up to the first Starcade, Harley Race and Ric Flair, Flair for the Gold. And, you sent in an inter- y'all sent in an interview with Harley Race, and you conducted the interview from the Tarrant County Convention Center. And we'd never seen you do interviews with the talent, but you were representing. You know, you said this is you know David Manning with World Class Wrestling Association at the Tarrant County Convention Center with Harley Race, and he was actually there to defend against Iceman King Parsons. Because as soon as I heard it, I'm like, that had to have been the Iceman match, but. Uh, but for you to be doing the interviews and sending them out to the different territories, that was something we never, I mean, all these years later surprised me when I heard it. Yeah. Well, not only that, I was in charge of syndication. We sent out, <laughs> we were in four, every Wednesday morning, I sent out 48 tapes to 48 different sta- uh, locations around the United States. Um, and then we would also send to Israel. We would also, you know, and because uh, back then they would just take that tape and air it. it theirs was always a week behind what ours was. And um, but we were I mean, we were pulling 15 ratings in New York when Vince was pulling 11. We were pulling uh, Vern Gagne in Chicago. You know, Kerry goes up there and they do 25,000 people for the main event. Um, and so uh, and Israel, I would do the interviews for Israel and send them to Israel and. Um, and nobody will ever understand how big we were in Israel. I mean, when we, the, the, I didn't go on the first tour, but when Kev called, when they landed at the, at the tarmac in Israel, there was 30 something thousand people there. And after about three appearances, Perez, who was the, the, the prime minister came to the hotel where the boys were at and said, you can't make any appearances, the Von Erichs, because people weren't even going to work. Um, I mean, it, people will think I'm joking hearing this. Matter of fact, a great story Tom Landry told us 
he was in Israel and he went into a diamond store and the guy recognized him and says, oh my God, you're the coach. And Tom's like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, you, you live in Dallas. You must know the Von Erichs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even, even to this day, I mean, it hadn't been that long since Kevin was still, Kevin had maintained a great relationship with Israel and the Israel and the people of Israel. It, his actual world championship belt is on display in a mall in Israel. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had his final match there. Yeah. It was, you know, we had a lot going on there. You know, I know you guys have heard the story when I had to sneak Chris out of Israel and, um, we sold out soccer fields, not stadium, not inside buildings, soccer fields. Uh, when we, when we went there on the tour, I was on, we did uh, Haifa, Tel Aviv, Kiryat Haim, all soccer fields. And we sold out every one of them, same wrestlers every night, just mixing up the matches. And, um, Matter of fact, they had a a vote, a poll in Israel of who was the most beautiful woman in the world. Farrah Fawcett got second, Sunshine got first. <laughs> Go Sunshine! Yeah, hey, you couldn't have told you couldn't have, you couldn't have told eighteen year old me any different. <laughs> yeah, I, she didn't. It, she didn't have any competition until until Missy Hyatt showed up. Yep. I noticed, uh, Mr. Manning, on your hand, do you have like a Hall of Fame ring? What kind of ring do you have on? This is, uh, I used to bowl some. Oh, uh-huh. And so if 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 at any time you shoot uh, 800 or more for three games in a row, you got to average 267. Yeah. A, uh, American Bowling Congress will send you the gold ring. Oh. And so I've got two of these. I've had 18 300s. Oh my uh, I used to bowl quite a bit. I never went pro, but I bowled a lot with some of the pros in doubles tournaments and stuff like that. But I used to do it more or less as a hobby, played golf. I always say there's very few people who can say they've had a hole in one. They've bowled a 300 <laughs> and they've been in the main event at um, numerous buildings. I was going to say, definitely. You have, uh, you have quite the life story. I like that. So you're a bowler too. I like it. And, and I just now, this past week, I'm going to go ahead and write the book. Every time I do one of these or every time I'm on, a, I'm on a show, they always want a book. And I always say, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And um, After we did the thing with Kevin Von Erich, you know, Ke who would have thought Kevin and I did the thing with Del Hansen at the, at the Fairmont Theater. And we had over 2,000 people there. The average ticket was $60 to come hear us BS. Uh -huh. I was like, I just couldn't believe it. And Dale said the same thing, man, when's your book coming out? Cause I'm getting it. And I oh, said, you know, I've had so many offers. So I was just on a river cruise in Europe from Budapest to Vienna and I own a big travel company, extreme travel. And so, um, I, I just decided last week there was a guy on the ship and he's like, you gotta let me write your book, man. He was, a, and he's a big fan. And so he sent me some samples and questions, and so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Yay! Well, you have tremendous stories. A great storyteller. And and, <laughs> and I mean, daughter's having a problem. <laughs> I mean, before we came on, we talked a little bit about, you know, he got to spend some time with Rick. He also got to spend some time with Harley Race. <laughs> no, Harley was. People don't know. Here's what Harley would do. You'd go to the bar. I've never seen anybody could drink as much beer as Harley other than Andre, but you'd go to the bar and Harley would be, he would order a drink. And so he would be like, what, what do you have a kid? I say, um, I'm, you know, whatever the beer of the night was. And, uh, so Harley would order it. Well, he would drink his in a matter of seconds. And then he would order another round, not him a beer. He would order a round. And then when he got to his third beer, he would order a round. Well, pretty soon you had six beers sitting in front of you with him going, come on, come on, come on, drink up. <laughs> and uh, so I thought I'd outsmarted him because I got really sick one night when I'm out with him. And so th the next time I go out with him, I said, uh, they go, what do you want? He orders a beer. And I go, uh, I think I'll have a crown and seven tonight. And Hardy goes, oh, my God, I didn't know you drank alcohol. That's my favorite. Two of them. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <clears throat> I couldn't but, imagine. 
But there used to be a club here in town called the Bell Ringer. I don't know if you remember. It was over on the loop. So Harley and I go out one night. We've been drinking. We go to the Bell Ringer. He wants to go. So we go to the Bell Ringer. This is a true story. The Bell Ringer had a lot of the SMU and the different football players as bouncers. So we get there. And I forget what happened. Something made Harley kind of pissed off. But we go in and we're playing pool. And one of the bouncers said something. And so Harley's like, hey, what are you looking at? And then here comes another bouncer, another bouncer. And so the, the guy that runs the bar, the manager, he comes back and says, hey, we don't want any problems. Sorry about what, what happens. And he gives us both a beer. And so I go to take a drink and Harley's like, don't drink that. It's probably Mickey. He says, pour it on the pool table. <laughs> now I live here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know. I've already said, pour it on the pool table. And he pours his. So I pour mine on the pool table. So now there's like, and I'm not kidding you, eight or nine bouncers looking at us. And Hardy says, are we going to look or are we going to dance? He said, me and the kid will whoop every one of your ass. And I'm like, Okay. So <laughs> a lot of people don't know, but Harley, he was in a burl bag car wreck. So in, in, yeah, this arm right here, in one of his arms right here, he had a steel plate under the skin where they put him together. So it was like a sledgehammer. So I can see we're going to have, it's going to go down. And then all of a sudden here comes the manager again. He's like, Hey, we don't want a problem. This and that. And, you know, and so there's another side to the bar. So anyway, we end up, everything's kind of cool. So he brings us around, puts us right in the front where they got something going on there, you know, and uh, it's it's some kind of night where girls are going up on the stage and trying to win something. And one of the bouncers gets right in front of Hardy where he can't see. And there's a rail that ran, probably met him about mid back. Hardy says, excuse me, you're in my way. The guy looked, didn't do anything. He says, you're in my way. He looks. Next thing I know, Hardy's got him by the hair and literally bent double over this rail. Look, His face is looking at us. And uh, Hardy said, I said, you're in my way. And lets him go, and we all jump up, and I'm thinking, okay, it's going down. And the manager comes and gets us, and he tells all his bouncers, get back. And he takes us to the door, and he goes, you guys leave. He said, I'm not going to let them out. And as we're going out the door, one of them said, Manning, I know you'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, thank we got in the car. I said, thanks, Harley. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> and I didn't go back. Oh, I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't gonna they weren't gonna have any Harley race. Uh b- before we finish up here, let me ask, let me ask you my, about David Von Eric. He was my favorite. He was by far my favorite of all the Von Erics. I didn't know that he had been to Florida when I when I started watching and later learned about his work in Florida. There's no doubt in my mind he would have been world heavyweight champion. Skandar Akbar told me in 2010 that had David lived, everybody would still be working. So Kevin and I talk about this. It's not a secret. Dave, Dave was into the business for Kevin and Kerry really weren't into the business side of it, you know? And so Dave, Dave and I went to Fritz, gosh, I want to say in 81, maybe 82 and asked Fritz, could we start promoting some shows together? And so Fritz gave us Lawton, Oklahoma. He gave us Tyler, Texas, and we would run monthly shows there. And uh, I would do most of the legwork, put the placards out and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, because Dave didn't have time. You know, he was on the road. So I would go in and I would do the radio shows and Dave would do the radio shows. And so we got to where we were selling out those two venues every month. And um, and then Dave started coming to some of the booking meetings. Um, he just had a head. He he had a business head on him. And so Ke- Kevin, and I have said it before. If if any Von Eric dies other than Dave the business probably moves forward because probably I I would say if Dave doesn't die within a year and a half to two years, he's probably Fritz has turned everything over to him to run. 
because uh, Fritz was taking more and more time off. I People don't know it. Even when I was the assistant booker with Ken, every Thursday or Friday, I had a beeper and it had one person had the number. <laughs> and I would get a beep. And back then, you know, you had to go find a pay phone and make the call. I would have to call down. Fritz was uh, down in Edom or even when he was up in Lake Dallas. And it would be basically, how's everything going? What happened this week? Uh, if he didn't make the booking meeting and I would go through everything and, you know, then we would sign off on it. And when, uh, and then when y'all eventually left the NWA, Crockett had made a play at the NWA convention where they said that if you were going to book the, if you were going to book the world champion, you're going to have to book their talent too. Was that, was that the tipping point that made y'all decide it was time to, to leave the NWA and go to, and go to, uh, to, and do your own thing with your own champion? No, the tipping point was uh, when Car when Obviously, we were pushing for Dave to get the belt in Texas Stadium. The belt would have switched to Dave. But when Dave died, we pushed Kerry in, and Fritz didn't give him an option. He said, you got to flip the belt. And so we flipped the belt there. Kerry was to wear the belt for about six months. But instead, he had to go to Japan to defend. And when he went, Harley was there, Rick was there they flipped the belt back without telling us. And Fritz was livid. So when we went into the booking meeting that week, Fr Fritz basically said, F them. Well, you know, y'all they want to do that to us. We go on our own. We don't need them. Well, y'all had said that for years that he was supposed to be champion longer. And in a private setting, a few, a couple years ago, Rick even said that he was going on vacation. He thought Kerry was going to have it longer. And he was told to go to Japan and get it. And I was always wondering, because Rick Rick said that and he said that he thought Kerry missed a shot. But I, Kerry, Kerry was 18, 18 defenses in 18 days, so he didn't miss a shot. No, he didn't miss a shot. That's a story that got out there. Uh, they just decided to take the belt off of him. Did, and, did Eddie uh, Graham have anything to do with it since Kerry went through Florida? And maybe, I mean, back then when Rick, when Rick went through the territories, I mean, they did big business. Did Eddie panic because of it and, and get it called off? Or I think just to lay it out there, the, the wrestling industry was scared of world class. I mean, we had so much power. You know, the, I'm not going to get into it on here, but there was a meeting that took place in Dallas for the merge of New York and Dallas, and we would have been the majority partner. But at that time, we had one dead Von Eric. But Fritz was like, why do we need you? And, you know, and, and, and Fritz's biggest concern, as you know, Dave, back then, you had, you had Bill Watts was, was Mid-South. You had Crockett, the Carolinas. You had Barnett, Atlanta. You had uh, Bob Geigel in Harley, Kansas City. You had Mike LaBelle, California. You know, Vern Gagne, Chicago. What are you going to do to all those guys if we go national? Are you going to let them still be the promoters? And, um, you know, and hats off to Vince Jr. We can all say what we want, but when Vince Sr. died, Vince Jr. said, let's go. And, you know, and, uh, hey, the guy's a genius. I mean, they, they, they turned it into a multi-billion dollar operation. Yes, sir. And, uh, but I, but I always say that, uh, if you look real deep in wrestling and go back, it all started right here in Dallas, Texas. And every, every big name that made it up there. Had it's like we were the farm class. club. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people don't realize that Shawn Michaels got a haircut from Gino and Chris. Yes, Rick, Rude, Austin. Rick Rude was here. Rick Rude was here as enhancement talent when he was still spelling it R O O D. Uh, Steve Austin. The yes. first time the first time Steve wrestled out of Austin, I used him on one of my Caribbean shows. You know. So, well, 
I hey, can't, I it, can't it's been a hell of a ride. I enjoyed it. it. I'm blessed. It led me to so many different things, motivational speaking. I was the host of Easter Seals, you know, for years and years and years. And then, then I got into motivational speaking and uh, I've been blessed in businesses. Uh, I've, I've uh, managed to sell a few and uh, got some beautiful land now down at Big Cypress River. And I like to hunt. I like to fish. And um, I still talk to Flair. I, matter of fact, I texted him yesterday. Was he going to be in town for AEW? And he sent back, damn it, no. <laughs> so uh, probably saved me a night out. <laughs> saved so, your liver. The good thing about your podcast, when I did Rick's podcast, I kept telling people throughout the whole podcast, that was the old David Manning. <laughs> I was like, Rick, we can't tell some of these stories. Well, hopefully you'll put some of them in your book. They'll all be in the book. Oh, goodness. Uh, you know, That's why you're going to be a bestseller right there, because all those good stories are going to be in the book. I used to say I was going to wait for a few more of the boys to, 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 to die off so they can't whip my ass. But, hey, what the heck? I'm going to go with it. Well... I'm going to tell you from when, from my years, my years of going to the sportatorium and sitting there, I knew that I was too young to be a, I knew I was too, too little to be a wrestler. That was never going to happen. But what I did want to be was David Manning. <laughs> I wanted to be the referee that stood up to the bad guys that caught them messing up. I mean, the, when you, when you were Christmas night, when David challenged flair and flair threw David over the top rope, and you said, no, we're not going to disqualify him for it. And I mean, to me, there he is. <laughs> David's not letting this crap go down this time. And then, of course, you eventually had to disqualify him because he just kept on. But but what I'm saying is, is that I knew I couldn't be the wrestler, but I wanted to be. And I even went down to Doug's gym in 1984 trying to figure out how I could pursue this. And they ran me out of there. And I wish I'd have been more persistent because it took me, it took me till I was 40 years old before I was able to do it. But I just want you to know that out of, out of everything that was going on in world class and, and I wanted to be you and, and, and I try to referee in the, in the style of David Manning to this day. Well, you know, we, we had a lot of people come to the sports room and want to be a wrestler. We never had any come want to be a referee. <laughs> you should have come down there. A man's got to know his limitations. And the funny thing was they would come to the sportatorium and, most people didn't know my wrestling background, you know, with the collegiate and stuff. And uh, so I would always go down to the ring with them. And then Bronco would always come down and go, my God, how can you wrestle? You can't even beat the referee. <laughs> <laughs> Your well, daughter has mentioned that you in the chat, I think we need to have her on too, because she's really helping bring out some information. She said you used to have one of Rick's robes. I did. Uh, he left it. It was actually from a reunion. He left it trying to make the plane. And so I had it for years and years and years. And unfortunately, um, one of my exes took it and uh, I think sold it on eBay. <laughs> well, that kind of stuff. Happens. Yeah, I, had, <laughs> I, had, I had his robe and uh, happened to Rick a lot, too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, you know. Well, you Rick left a lot one? more clothes than that behind sometimes. I bet he did. Well, do you remember what color it was? I mean, it was know. uh it was red with uh, silver writing on the back. It was the butterfly. Oh. So when you opened it up like this, you know, it, it had the, the almost oh, like wow. wings sticking out. And uh it was it was really, really nice. It's too bad I, I don't have it. It you know, when I when I went down to the uh I have a phenomenal picture sometimes uh it's back in the back bedroom that it's all of the inductees to the hall of fame, not, not Vince's hall of fame. I call it the real hall of fame. And on that deal, you know, I was one of the outside ones and uh, Austin was on there and um, chief Peter Mavia. And um, it was, uh, it was crazy that they, when they moved the hall of fame from New York down to Wichita falls, uh, they wanted me to put some stuff in it in the Hall of Fame, and I didn't have anything. But you know, between it's just all disappeared over the years. I didn't even have. Matter of fact, they wanted the referee shirt that I have the referee shirt from Texas Stadium, and they were going to put it up there because I have a picture, you know, where I'm standing in the ring between Flair and Kerry, and uh, and all of those people in the background. There it is, right there. And you guys were on top of it. That is a look 
and a half right there. <laughs> that I was 42,000 people. Oh, man. That was a big deal. The NWA title did not change hands like titles oh, yeah. change hands today. No, because matter of fact, you're talking about refereeing. Back then, you went down in history if, if the title changed. That was what was excited for me that night. I don't care whether you know what's going down or not. My name was going to go down in the record books as the referee for that match when the title changed to uh, Kerry Von Erich. I mean, even in, in a few years ago, I had I, I was actually able to referee an NWA World Title match. It wasn't a title change, but it was. But getting to stand in the, getting to stand in the middle of the ring and hold that ten pounds of gold over your head is mm -hmm. is a thrill. Even even not, not I can't even imagine what it would have been like when you did it. Well, you know, I mean, you were refereeing for the greatest wrestlers that ever lived. Well, I'll tell you, the first time I wrestled a world title match, I was actually nervous. I had never, you know, and I, uh, Ricky Steamboat was the champion. And so we're in Corpus Christi, Texas. And I'm going to referee the bout that night uh, Rick, with him and uh, one of the Von Erichs. I can't remember who. And it was crazy because I'm sitting in the uh, hotel we stayed in and I'm in having breakfast. And I look up and Steamboat comes in the restaurant. He's looking around, comes over to my table, says, you care if I sit with you and sets down. And that's the first time I had met him was right there. You know, he sits down and he goes, what are you doing today? And I said, I don't know, just probably hanging around here. He said, there's a new movie out. Let's go see it. And I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, it's called Grease or something like that. And uh, so we went to the movies <laughs> and, and saw Grease. <laughs> come back and I go in the ring and uh, we did an hour Broadway with him and uh, whichever Von Erick it was uh, great, great, great guy. Uh, but yeah, I was, I'm actually nervous that I'm doing a title match, but you know, I did, I switched the NWA title. I also switched the AWA title when Bachwinkle was champion. Oh. Uh, yeah. And, and, um, and then the uh, God, what was the other belt? I mean, when we were big, I got calls. I got I, I refereed the Superdome with uh, the Sheik and the Butcher. Not many people even wanted to referee that because you're liable to get cut to pieces. Um, but I did that match, and uh, I was doing some stuff up in St. Louis. I got a lot of calls back then. You know, it was pretty neat. Didn't you? Did Crockett use you at Reunion Arena during the Great American Bash one time? Well, I did a special referee, and uh, I did a special referee thing. One time, I don't know if it was with Crockett or who it was with. Flair, Flair, you know, was trying to get me to come to Jimmy for a long time. And um, so when I finally left world class, uh, I actually went with uh, Crockett. And I was, uh, th they had an office building over here off of uh, the tollway. And myself and uh, uh, Barnett was there. Dusty was there. J.J. Uh, Dillon was uh, uh, helping out then. So I literally officed over there, but they didn't utilize my talents uh, the way I wanted to. Matter of fact, one time I went into Barnett's office and I said, Jim, what the hell? I said, I can add a lot more here. And you know, Jim, he was like, are you getting your check every week? And I said, yeah, comes on time. I said, yeah, he goes, go sit down in your office and just be cool. I said, okay. <laughs> well. Mr. Manning, thank you. I, I, I appreciate all the time. We weren't planning on keeping you this long, and I know your time is really valuable. You don't know how much this means to me and Amy that you that you would come on with us and spend this time and tell these stories. Uh, I can't. If if when that book's ready, I hope you come back and promote it on here. I definitely will. I would definitely. I mean, we could we could talk all night. I, I know that I didn't even scratch the surface of of the stories that you could tell. No. And, and I do thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you and your family have a great Christmas season. And 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 let's see. Mr. Manning, what is your favorite memory of WCCW at the Mesquite Rodeo? If you have one. Asking for my parents who used to go before I was born. Yes, Amy. I, okay. <laughs> well, one night uh, I refereed Brody and, uh, gosh, who was at Abdullah there. And they fought all over the arena. But – what was the highlight of the night back then, Donnie Gay 
was like five-time world champion bull rider. And so we had set it up that during the intermission, Donnie Gay was going to ride a bull. Okay. And so when Donnie came in, we all met him and back in the dressing room and everything. So I come back from the, one of the matches and I go in and here's Donnie Gay. And he had both legs, both thighs are taped. He's taping his ribs all the way around with, you know, he's got the uh, uh, ace bandage going all the way around, tight as hell. He's taping his shoulder. And I said, my God, you look like you're going to war. He goes, I am for eight seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Bless. <laughs> Those shows were different. Yeah, they were. They were different. Yeah, they were. It, you know, it, it, it was crazy who all was coming to wrestling, you know. We talk about Donnie Gay. We, you know, uh, gosh, so many celebrities in town. Chuck Norris and different people. They were such big fans. And, uh, you know, when I first got in the business, everybody had the same story. Well, I was flipping through the TV and I saw some of the match. Well, then when Nielsen and Arbitron came out, we knew everybody was watching wrestling. <laughs> the, the, the gig was up, you know. It was must see. Justin, I, I appreciate you guys having me on. I, I'd be glad to come back sometime, have the uh, have all your listeners send in, in questions. And if, if there's – I don't dodge any questions. I, I'll, I'll answer the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, um, tell everybody tell everybody where they can find you and what uh, and, and t um, tell them about your, um, your business again, Extreme Travel. I own a company called Extreme Travel, and it's spelt with an X. It's like X and a running stream. X stream, X S T R E A M Travel. Um, you can go to extremetravel.com, and what we do is we actually host people that want to become a travel agent. We live in a world today where everybody should be their own travel agent, if you want to know the truth. And so we have an online university they can go through and become a travel agent, and we have about thirty-five hundred of them around the U.S. and the Caribbean. Uh, we're expanding into Canada this year. We do about a hundred million in travel every year. Um, and so, um, on, on Facebook, it, it, I'm David E. Manning. Um, and, um, you know, I hear from, a, I'm out there, the, the, the different podcasts and the different things that are out there. It's, uh, it's crazy. I was actually coming back from Japan. I think it was two years ago, three years ago before the pandemic. And uh, I'm sitting in the in one of the lounges, and they were showing one of the old ESPN wrestling tapes. And the sad part of the tape was, out of out of a tag team, two other matches, the ref, the, the the announcer, and me, I was the only one on the tape alive. Mm. <laughs> I was like, wow, but um. That's why it's really important you start writing that book. Oh, yeah, it is. You know? It needs to be out. Plus, I can tell, like, like I say, I've got a list. Because back then, we could do pranks and stuff. They don't do anymore. Right. I mean, I could write a book just on what I've seen pranks. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, you know. And and fights behind the scene. Uh-huh. You know? I, I tell people one night I'm, we're coming back from San Antonio. I got I got Michael Hayes, Terry Gordy, Bill Irwin in the back seat, front seat. I got Jimmy Garvin, Sunshine, and I'm driving. And all of a sudden, Michael's like, "Pull over, pull over on 35." Terry Gordy and and Irwin had gotten an argument about who could run fastest. So we get out on the shoulder of 35. <laughs> Michael, we map we mark off 50 yards, and Michael's going to start him. And I'm at the finish line, and I'm like, "Go!" And they took their boots off, and so they're running like hell on the side of 35 and then Monday night comes and their feet, their feet are so blistered up. <laughs> <laughs> Who won Mr. Manning? Uh, Terry Gordy won. Did he by Terry a lot? No, it was close all it was the way. <laughs> I was afraid one of them was going to take a, fa a face plant and couldn't make Monday night. And then I'd have had to answer to Fritz. You'd have been in trouble. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for your time tonight. We can't thank you enough. This is a huge thrill. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, like I say, give me a holler. We'll do we'll it do again it. sometime. That's thank you so good. much. Yes, David Manning, thank everybody. You. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. How about that, y'all? Woohoo! Mr. David Manning. He announced on our show he's going to do a book. We're super excited. I, you don't think I won't pre-order that one? I, I, I 
I need to thank you so much for letting me get a question in. I figured I was just going to sit back and look pretty. I'm a giver. <laughs> That's what I do. You are. That's my nature. Merry he was Christmas. a great guest. I mean, like you said, I... That's, you know, that's one of the things I love, especially like listening to like um, some of the older wrestlers who have podcasts and different things like that. They just tell you stories like, like you said, like this, you can imagine this group in the car, you know, no cell phones, no iPods, you know, they're just listening to the radio, driving from wherever. And then these two guys are fighting about who's, go, you know, who's fastest. So then they get, you know, I mean, I, I just think those kind of things, those are just, those are stories I think that wrestling fans really do live for. And I am super excited that he is going to do that. And I am, I did want to say to you, but I got to find it. Okay. So I didn't want to say it with Mr. Manning on because I didn't know how it would be taken. But what well, I'm reading the Rick Flair. The well, I mean, I'm not trying to, I mean, so I'm reading the uh, Ric Flair book by Tim Hornbaker. Okay. You know which one I'm talking about? I do. I hadn't got it yet. Believe it or not. Um, and they were talking. And so I was reading this part and uh, I was going to say something to you. And then Mr. Manning brought it up, but it was talking about why they switched the belt like they did. This is, and this is according to uh, Tim. And now I got to figure out exactly where it was. However, I want to I want to summarize it real quick until I can find exactly what it was said. But it was because this is what the book was saying that they had dates in New York where they had advertised Ric Flair as champion to be defending against whatever, and they were um, they did not want to go in with Kerry because of that New York market. And that's when WWF was kind of starting to branch out a little bit more. I'm going to try to find this because like I said, I read it and I was like, oh, you know, that made me think, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, and like I said, I'm sorry, that's not the that's not the exact wording, but that was what this was saying, that the reason why they did that change so quickly is because they had already advertised and they had sold it out for Ric Flair being champion against I don't know I'll have to look I'll find it and well, they were going uh, into the Meadowlands so it would have been Flair and um, I'm trying to remember who they booked for the Meadowlands wasn't Flair and Dusty maybe no I don't feel like it was let's see here was it Flair and Magnum at the time well, there he is well oh you remember oh <laughs> yeah here's the deal Okay. That's all BS because Dave, you probably know anytime you book the world heavyweight champion, there's a disclaimer uh -huh. that, that says it's out of our control. If the belt has changed hands, right. because it's going to be the world champion. You're promoting the world heavyweight champion. I experienced it. Right. I experienced right. it. Cause I, can't, I showed up for international star Wars wanting Kevin's rematch with Rick from, from, from fair park to, to, I was all pumped. And I got to the show, and Harley Race was the champ, and I'm like, exactly. And I was pissed. Had you <laughs> not only that, that, now, 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 New York may not have wanted Carrie there because, like I said, we were pulling a bigger rating than they were. Mm -hmm. And um, and the other thing is, you want your you want your you want the champion to be a heel, right, right, because the people want to they they don't want Michael Hayes to win the title. <laughs> But when you do it that way, you got to root for your rooting to your hometown guys, the Hill. And so Carrie was a big time baby face everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that made it hard for him to go in and work against, you know, a, a Magnum TA or a, a Dusty Rhodes or a, because the fans are like. Right. I realized when Carrie won the belt that it wasn't Carrie chasing it wasn't carry wanting to see carry win the belt as much as it was as that i was i was going for rick flair i didn't understand but it was like that old that a dog chasing a car what's he gonna do if he catches it right right and that's when i realized but i always knew that i mean until like i said i heard rick say it in a private setting that he did not expect to get that belt back he was going on vacation 
Well, so. that's true. And then the thing is, it's not a glamour life being the world heavyweight champion. It is when you're in the ring. It is brutal travel. You know, the interviews, the the way you got to carry yourself. Um, and I would say you got to, you know, <laughs> do certain things. But Rick broke all those molds, uh, you know, w w taking his clothes off in the bars or wherever. But um, it was, um, I don't know, it was a political move. Uh -huh. And it would have probably been better if they would have told us they were going to do it. We found out when Kerry called us mm. and Fritz was livid. I imagine. So you uh, think they just use that? Uh, have you read, have you read the Ric Flair book by Tim? I read or, some or? of the book and whoever, I, I can't remember who gave me the book. It was missing about 10 pages in the middle. I don't know if that was <laughs> pictures they ripped out or what. Oh. The, book I, the book I would actually like to read. Uh, and you, it's crazy what it sells for now is the Gary Hart book. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can't find it. You I mean, you can't you can't it. find it's like it anywhere. dollars. But really, yeah, Gary Gary was not uh, Gary was a little upset when Fritz let him go. He fired him here. Uh, literally caught him having the rule was you couldn't drink during the day during you know, and Gary got busted and Fritz had warned him and so he let him go. But uh, I heard some of the stuff Gary wrote. Um, it, it's really sad because Gary is the one that set up for the birds to come here. And then he missed the ride. Mm. Yeah. You know, truthfully, anyone could have been the booker for those first two years. Uh, you know, my mom could have probably threw the matches together and we'd have sold out <laughs> because <laughs> it was, it was just too easy. Like you, like you, like you said, we had three free birds and we right. had three monarchs. And, uh, yeah. and and people don't understand. That's why Lance was thrown in the way he was because, matter of fact, Dave, uh, this is coming out. D Magazine has a thing coming out. They sent me early editions because they interviewed me for it, but it's called The Fake Von Eric. Oh. And it's about Lance. Interesting. It's, it's Lance's Lance story. It comes, out, it comes out this month, December, uh, D Magazine. So it's a pretty good story. It's about eight pages, so it's a good they covered a lot, you know, and they got about 90% of it right. Well, my kids still live there, so I'll make I'll be able to get a copy. Yeah. So all right, guys, I'm gonna hop off and well, we weren't trying to run you off. It's just yeah, a... and I wasn't trying to bring you back here. I just <laughs> I no, just no, no, remembered no. that uh I remember reading that and I was like, Oh, I'm gonna tell Dave that because that's something that we've talked about on the show before anyway, uh, about the the it being short and kind of what might have happened. And I read that and I was like, oh, I'm going to tell Dave that. And then. Well, they tried to say he missed a show. No. Right. No. Well, I mean, you look at his schedule. There was nowhere to miss. I right. Mean, 18 defenses in 18 days. And it wasn't like a, a defense every day. He doubled up on Sunday. Right. 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 Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, you know, it was business, but it was. It was just something they're saying to make it like it was their hands were tied. Yeah. But it really was it like, you know. I understand. Well, <laughs> we're gonna play hey, trivia. We're hey, gonna play trivia with the audience. Best thing that ever happened to us. That's right. That's right. Because it pushed Fritz over the edge, and we broke away on our own. And boy, then it, it that was great. When we, you know, then we were in demand everywhere. You know, and that is something. You know, they'll say that about WWF that it really turned itself up when WCW got hot, you know, when it was actual competition, you know, I mean, and that's probably kind of like you're saying, like there was something that was motivating. Well, you to know? give I you mean, an example, you weren't motivated, but you know what I mean? To give uh, you an example of how much the McMahons thought of the Von Ericks when David died, he got a 10 bell salute on their syndicated program. Definitely. Yeah. He didn't do that for no, nobody else was getting that. Right. Yeah. They were letting right. the iron sheet come down and wrestle. They were letting Ricky steamboat come wrestle the cotton bowl. WWF yeah. didn't share talent back then. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they thought an awful lot of, of world class. Well, it, it was, uh, you could write a whole story just on that funeral and how many people turned out and that it was crazy. You I know, was I there. Don't think, I don't think people realize how much we were that. That's when it really showed how much we were over. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, yeah, when you Davis, guys, Davis told us he went and I like skipped school said, and went. I actually got in the church. It was in the balcony, but you I mean, were really lined lucky. up. So there's like 5,000 outside that church. Mm -hmm. I mean, you couldn't, it was, I, I'd never seen, and to this day, very seldom have ever seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the big, the, and we never knew who exactly did it. We think a guy named Jimmy Aston did it because back then he was over all the Republic banks. He was a big, big wheel. But back then, you know, with a funeral possession, you could, you could shut off a road, but you couldn't shut off a highway. Yeah. Well, when we left, when we left Denton, we had to go all the way to uh, Oak Cliff to the burial. When we got on 35 in Denton, there was no cars. We started going. And at every entrance to that highway, there was either a motorcycle cop or a police car. And then when we entered Irving, the Irving police were at every deal. When we entered Dallas, the Dallas police took over. And every time we would, we would be going, uh, they would pass the Hirsch. After, after we passed their exit, they would let people on, and then they would go on ahead. And then when we got to uh, the cemetery for like a mile was all of those policemen, the either standing beside their car or standing beside their motorcycle saluting mm. as the hearse went by. It was crazy. It was crazy. <laughs> so, mm. all right, guys. Go in here well, before thanks. my wife kills me. All right. Yes, please do. Please do. <laughs> all right, thanks. Well, thank you so much. You bet. Bye -bye. <laughs> Good night. Bye -bye. I'm not gonna say nothing else. Just to... <laughs> no, I'm just. <laughs> I'm getting mad at me. <laughs> but I thought that was inter. You know, like this is the said, last episode, y'all. We can't top that. No, we can't. Well, how are we gonna top that? I, I well, don't know how we're gonna top that. Tells us about his book. I think we could top it with that. That's the only reason we're gonna keep going. We're gonna keep going until David Manning writes his book. That's true. Can you imagine that is gonna be a Oh, y'all, I was making it a point to not try to ask him the stuff that I've already heard. I didn't want to recycle what I've heard him tell. Right. And I wanted to try to get some new stuff, and that's why we did it. So I just, and the things that I've wanted to ask him for so long, and I mean, I've been busting at the seams since I heard Rick say that. And I wanted to ask about the, the transitioning to world-class uh to, to do their own thing. He is such a fascinating man. And I couldn't help but fanboy out and tell him. I mean, but literally I, that's, I wanted, I wanted to be David Manning because he was the coolest referee. You knew if David Manning was in the ring that, 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 that the bad guys were, they weren't going to get away with their crap mm -hmm. as much. When Bronco was in there, you knew Bronco was going to miss it. Right. And I wish we would have talked about Bronco a little more too. So I, Nope, I, I'm definitely going to ask him to come back again. Definitely. Definitely. Like you said, I mean, you could do story. I mean, every once a month, there's probably something new that can be discussed. I like. Um, and I, and let's, let's acknowledge our chat. Let's acknowledge oh, yes, the, I'm the, sorry. the crowd yes, because, yes, yes. hey, y'all, I didn't know I was going to get him that long. So I didn't mean to ignore y'all right off the bat. You know, we got T. We, we got Coach Keith Morrison. There's Allison Faye, Brandon Ad, uh Brandon, oh, Braden. I bet you, oh, Braden's oh. a son in law. Braden's got to be a son in law. Okay. Um, I've talked to his daughter on TikTok before. She's I think, fun. I think she's got some stories. I want to. We, uh, because I, I had answered, I said, so that's David, Man that's about, uh, that referee was David Manning, and she, being his daughter, that, and we kind of had a little back and forth because I was such a huge fan. Uh, Thomas Crown, uh, JB, JB Games, Willie Buck. Efren, Willie Buck. I do. I did found that passage. I just it. Oh, book in the talk. territories here. Book in the territory. Yes, I saw them. Yeah, uh, that uh, that'd be Mike. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Mike Mills behind that that screen name. Who we've talked. I don't know if Lance Lance mentioned it to him, but we're gonna try to get get with them to uh, talk about the Iron Claw movie. Now I'm like super. Excited. Lance saw it. Lance saw it last night. Did he? Lance Peterson saw it. 
He did. And all he would say about it, all he would say about it is that you can tell the love those brothers, that, that movie showed the loves that the brothers had for each other. So I'm going to go see it just as soon as it comes out. And I'm looking forward to getting with them and, and talking about the movie. Heck yeah. I know Dom and Marcus. Went there it is. It is, Mike. Oh, it is. I don't know if Lance told you, but we talked about simulcasting and reviewing the reviewing the movie. Booking, uh, they do the world class cast, and they've watched every episode. So, so just so we, just to be clear, you're right. It was the Meadowlands. It says before the Texas Stadium match, promotions for a big program at the Meadowlands Arena had begun in the NWA's first attempt to grab headlines in the backyard of Vince McMahon's WWF. The financial investment was significant, and Flair was advertised as the defending NWA champion against Ricky Steamboat. The show, billed as a night of champions, was going to be held on May 29th, and unless there was a plan in place to swap the belt again, Flair would be without the championship at the noteworthy event. They did in Flair Steamboat in 84? Uh, I don't I think guess. so. Well, maybe. Maybe that's before Ricky went up north. And it said, I, NWA took that into consideration, and officials felt it was prudent to pass the belts back to Flair before the Meadowlands card. Oh, yeah. The main event couldn't be watered down in the midst of a wrestling war. As a result, Kerry was informed, I guess, when they had all those people there, and they took the belt. No, you know, he was to drop it. But I'm just saying, I just wanted... That I just thought that was interesting. Of course, before I knew what Mr. M uh, Manning was going to say, I remember reading that. I was like, "Oh, I got to tell Dave." You know, we've well, been talking about stuff like that. I'm not saying that Tim Hornbaker. It, I'm not. I'm not questioning his research. Sure. But I'm saying what David Manning's been saying since 1984, and what Ric Flair said in private, in private in Chicago. Sure. Not in front of a not not out in, in in like a convention setting, in in a private, and it's it, it's not that I'm I'm telling something I shouldn't be telling. There's plenty right, of people in, in the green room hearing all this, but what I'm saying is, you take what David Manning said, and you take what Ric Flair said, and if you go somewhere in the middle, what David Manning is saying makes more sense than any other explanation that was given. Right. And again, that is, like you said, that's an explanation to show, well, this is why we did it. But we all know that, you know, like you said, what's really behind, you know, whatever they were mad, whatever, like you said. And, that, and we can't even argue that that was probably, and, and business-wise, putting it back on Flair to go to New York. Yes. I mean... Because let's face it, Kerry Von Eric, we talked about it. Kerry Von Eric versus Ricky Steamboat. It's fake. Yeah. The two biggest baby faces in the world. Right. I mean, if you want to know how great of a baby face Kerry Von Eric is, Google and find where he was in Florida. David was David was going to wrestle on a big show. Fritz was president of the NWA. Fritz, Kevin, and Kerry went to Florida to back David up on an interview. And Kerry tried to cut a hill promo, and it just... To me, right. I knew when I saw that. Oh no, Kerry can't be a bad guy. Right. I mean, he just didn't have it in him. Right. So. Tim, so. <laughs> and again, Tim is like you said. He's taking research. He probably have that. You know, that's probably what the NWA put out. You know what I mean? And so uh, that makes sense. You know, but like you said, we all know. Like you said, behind the scenes. That was great. I think. Hey, Mark. I hey, think Mark that, um, that just was in time really for trivia. Fun, really, really fun. Well, I remember seeing it in the after magazines, but I couldn't remember what year it was. But I do know they went up to the Meadowlands, and mm -hmm. and and Mike is saying that you know it in was May, book, May 29th. Oh, it was May 29th. I, I thought it was later in the year. Yeah. No, it was May 29th. And he won the title that. on May 6th. Okay. But yeah. Yeah, well, the book trivia. didn't say 90 80, or 84, but I mean, they were. But yes, it was May 29th, 1984. And tonight's trivia, I mean. I don't even know. What it, it would is. not even be fair for me to answer these. 
Right. So we're definitely we're definitely going to go to the we're going to go to the studio audience. Okay. Lord help me. I don't even know where my stuff is. Okay. How First great was this show so far? We didn't. Do, I just I'm on cloud nine, y'all. I ain't gonna sleep tonight. I know. It was very good. And he, like I said, he's a great storyteller. Oh, he's yeah. got lots of stories to tell. Uh, we only scratched the surface. And I'm going to get Shana, Shana, Shana to come on to talk more because I wanted to ask her. She said she sold merch. Did you see that? She sold merch I did. in the auditorium. Oh. I wonder if she ever had to sell her dad's photos. Like, what was that like? <laughs> He's telling the truth, though. There wasn't no Bronco Lubitsch photos. Well, no, I know, but I'm just saying, could you imagine you're selling your... I mean, I, what oh. she must have felt like. I don't know. I just... Oh, I guarantee I, you that they didn't go anywhere. They didn't go out and... They, they couldn't have gone out to eat without somebody recognizing him. Right. Oh, no, you're right. I mean... And he did. He was... I mean, he, he did a lot with Easter Seals. Him and the Von Erics would host the Easter Seals telethons. You know what's really cool about that when he was talking? The first thing I thought about was... David Crockett does the Red Cross. Like, it's so funny how, you know, that both of them um, got into programs that are um, helpful, I guess. I don't know. I don't. That's the first thing I thought about when he said that about the Easter Seals. It's like, how how cool, Dave, or, uh, David, Mr. But Crockett. You also got to keep in mind that World Class Championship Wrestling was broadcast on CBN. Channel oh, 39 right. was CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network. Well, and he said Fritz was a big, was a, was very, you know, very Christ, religious. And, uh, you know, he's, I, it's, I mean, we'll talk about it more after we see the movie. David, it, the, Mr. Manning elaborate, elaborated in the movie that it was uncomfortable for him because things weren't like they were. The, and even Kevin said, remember, you know, Kevin, the boys said, this is an entertainment. This is for entertainment. It's not a, it's not a documentary. Right. right. Well, they it's left a, one whole brother out. So, I mean, right. So, so I, mean, I mean, it's definitely they, but on the, on the verge of being. Now, do I think Fritz was a hard ass? Yes, I do. Um, my dad, my dad was a hard ass. Right. I worked in the family business and the family business, you know, my, my mom told my dad one time that she thought the store, she thought that grocery store was the other woman. And my dad let her know real quick and in a hurry that that grocery store was the only woman. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> and I mean, now see, you hear that and you're laughing, but anybody that hears that thinking, boy, your dad was horrible. Did he really say that to your mother? Right. But I mean, when I got shot, as soon as I saw my dad, the first thing I said to him is they didn't get the money. You got to get to the store because I threw it behind the checkout stand before somebody gets there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was programmed for the family business that even in my worst, even at, the, at my worst time, I protected it. Mm -hmm. And I was more worried about the, the store than I was myself. Right. So I can see that if Fritz was that way about his family business. Right. You know. To the and to the extent that he made up, he hired a fake Von Eric to try to keep that thing going mm -hmm. when it was all coming unraveled. So I can see that if I sit here and you didn't know anything and I've just told stories about my dad, he would come off just as bad as Fritz comes off in the trailer for the Iron Claw movie. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean. Even it that little scene where he says, hey, y'all know Carrie's my favorite. Well, my dad, I'm sure my dad said that I was his favorite. And then he might have said that my sister was his favorite. So, right. There was no context to that. You know, like you said, that, that I'm saying clip, it's keep yeah. in mind, it's the time that he was born, the time he grew up, the way things were then. Mm -hmm. You know, people aren't like that anymore. Right. It, 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 it just, and, it's, and, and after a couple generations, it's kind of lost. It's kind of lost even like people my age, when they hear Ric Flair say something he said 40 years ago, laugh at it. But a teenager in the early twenties are appalled by it mm -hmm. because they don't get it. Right. You know, it's, it's just, 
They don't understand. They don't understand old people is what I'm trying right. to say. Well, and I think too, and again, we'll have to see exactly how the movie lays it all out. At least, you know, it did seem for men in that older generation, uh, you know, the great depression, uh, baby boomers, whatever, like showing emotion or being soft, you know, might not have looked been looked upon as, uh, you know, something that you should be doing. So, you know, I, I think that it's going to be a great movie, a very interested. It will be interesting because I think at least with your help, Dave, you have given us and the audience such great knowledge about the sportatorium and kind of things that were going on and your fandom. It'll be interesting to see what doesn't seem to fit, you know, what we and, know, what and does. full disclosure, my fandom is through rose colored glasses. Oh, of course. I mean, it just is. And, and Mike, and I think Mike has just has, has said one of the mistakes we make sometimes is judging people from the past by today's standards. Definitely. I'm very critical of Fritz, but I think he meant well. He, he summed it right up there. Frit, Fritz meant well. Fritz loved his kids. Of course. I mean, uh, and I think Fritz, I think Fritz was genuinely a good man. And Brandon Perkins wanted to know, did I think the bigger hard ass was Fritz Von Erich or Stu Hart? I think Fritz Von Erich is probably much bigger hard ass than Stu Hart. Mm. I, I, but, but also Stu Hart didn't face as much tragedy as Fritz did. So, I mean, Stu, Stu and Helen are at ringside partaking right. in angles with Brett and Owen. I mean, he had that, he had that luxury. So, right. Well, and do you even think like in Calgary, like, do you feel like there was as much competition, you know, like did Frit or did Stu Hart in his, in the Calgary area, did, you know, did they have like, Fritz had NWA that he ended up partying with, you know, you have all these other little different territories that were, you know, <coughs> New York was trying to make a move. I don't feel like I don't feel like Calgary had that to be, you know, to where Fritz had to be more hard nosed and business minded and you know focus the kids or whatever than Stu did. Yeah. You know, he had the luxury. But Stu had a territory and he pushed his kids to the moon too. So oh well, yes, 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 yes. And Mark Dodder, were you going to have a show to do a movie review? We are. We're gonna we're gonna do that with. Um, we're going to do that with booking the territory, the world class cast. Uh, we're going to simulcast with them and, and review the movie. So, and um, hopefully we can do that the week after Christmas. We're going to try. We'll have to get together. We'll have to get together on scheduling. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be a real long show. It just, you know, it would, but I will get out to the movies to see it just as soon as it's not going to be available early here in Mississippi and there's only two movie theaters that are in within driving distance of me that I'm going to be able to go see it at. Are they, they're not doing any kind of streaming or anything that you know of, you know, like how Paramount, you know, we get movies all the time that are like Barbie and all these different things like that. We get movies like that. that I don't are, think there's going to be an early release. I mean, this is, like and if, from what I'm understanding that this movie's going to have, this movie can have some Oscar buzz. Awesome. It should. I mean, that's what I've heard, but. Right. We can only hope. Well, as we all know. It's Let's play trivia. I was going to say, it's getting close to my bedtime. You know, I, I can't, I can't stay up late. I'm, yeah. <laughs> this, these old bones have to go to bed. All right. Let's look at the first question, which I don't even know what it is. That is not the right one. But do you all want to guess when did Omega? No. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff and Matt are. While brothers. she's doing that, I'm going to answer Brandon Perkins. Who who asked the question? Dave. Dave, you come down here for the New Year's New Year's Stars game, and hell, I'll buy you uh, your movie ticket, and we'll go catch it. I would take you up on that if I could get New Year's Day off, because nothing makes me happier than ending the year watching my Dallas Stars play hockey. I love Definitely. going to the Dallas Stars New Year's Eve game. But people are going to want their Doritos. I know she got the right trivia because I saw that it downloaded. Bless her heart. Here we go. How about that? In the early 80s, 
David Von Erich left Texas and spent about a year in the NWA Florida's territory. What was unusual about David's time in Florida? He was hated by the Florida fans. He never won a match. He wrestled under a different name. And he was a manager, not a wrestler. So which of those four do you think was unusual about David's time in Florida? And Brandon Perkins, that was a mistype. He didn't, he did that before the trivia came up. So he's not answering that. I think most people in the chat are getting it. Terry Weaver got it. He's a heel. You actually mentioned that earlier in talking to Mr. Manning about how he, you know, had gone to Florida and was a heel and Fritz and all them came to try to. See, and I wish I would have asked him how they were handling that because people knew, some people knew because the, the wrestling magazines were covering it. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. But yes, you all are all correct. He was hated. He was That was too easy because Florida fans hate everything. Right. But he was a hated, he was hated by Florida fans. Would have liked to see more of that. What do you think? Do you think he could have pulled it off? As a David? Von Eric, well, no, I'm just saying, like, as a Von Eric and like the the family dynamics and love, and I don't know, like, do you think he could have been hated David? David didn't do anything any different in world class that he did in Florida. Mm -hmm. It just it against just, different people. Yeah, da da Magnum TA, David Von Eric, they didn't wrestle like good guys. Right. They they were brawlers. Right. And when David told you that, when David told you he was going to kick your ass, you believed that David was going to kick your ass. Right. But he was apparently against the baby faces of Florida. Is that what I mean? Oh yeah, he wrestled Dusty Rhodes, mm. Sweet Brown Sugar. Um, he beat Bar beat up Barry Windham. Uh, mm. Him and uh, him and Dory Funk Jr. were a team. He was he was Dor Dory Funk Jr.'s protege. And they beat the Briscoes, um, not 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 the Jack and Jerry. Yeah, Jack and Jerry, not J. M. Mark. The the original <laughs> Briscoes. Uh, they he beat they beat them for the tag team titles. David was the Florida Television Champion. David was the Southern Champion. Uh huh. So yeah, uh, David had some battles with Dusty Rhodes in Florida. And I was he twenty three when he died. Was he twenty three or twenty five? I was twenty five. He was 25. He was 20, regardless. Like, of all this, I mean, look, everything that he did, he died when he was 25. Like, it just, one of those things that just makes you think, like, what in the world could he have done? Yeah. Yes. I mean, it just, I don't know. One of those questions, you know, I guess. All right. Next question. They all got that one. Kerry Von Erich was chosen as an alternate for the 1980 United States Summer Olympic team. In what event did Kerry qualify? Was it the javelin, the weight or weightlifting, the 200 meter butterfly, or was it the discus? What did he, he was chosen as an alternate. And as we all know, we actually, again, this is something we talked about in our interview with Mr. Manning. The Summer Olympics were boycotted. So, we have the we have the greatest fans. They know they're smart. It was the discus, as he has the discus. Punch. Discus but punch. Anyway, but <laughs> uh... all right, Andrew Hermes hits the punch. A real finish, not that iron claw, and a bunch of laughing. You shut your pirate hooker mouth, sir. Oh, I'll have you not have you besmirch. The good name of the Iron Claw. Good name of the Iron Claw. All righty, next one. The Vaughn Eriks and the Fabulous Freebirds, one of the most famous feuds in professional wrestling history, began in light. Oh Lord, began in late 1982 when the Freebirds turned on one of the Vaughn Eriks. Which Vaughn Eric did they turn on? David, Carrie. Kevin or Fritz? Who did they turn on? Michael Hayes turned my mother on. Is her oh. name David Carey 
Kevin. Well, or you're Chris. talking about turning somebody on. I just was saying. I know that's the reason why I gave you A, B, C, or D. So you know we didn't have to. What's your mother's name? Carol. Carol. Carrie. Kevin. Carol. Dave. My friends. Uh, I think as most people, again, smart. It was Carrie. Remember, Rick Flair. Yeah, I know it. I just. I was just taking it somewhere else. I know you were. Yes. But, again, that goes back to, and that's kind of cool that Mr. Manny, like, he's the one that kind of, you know, they all, he's the one that helped come up with that finish. Well, like, yeah, and I mean, if you've ever. The finish around the, that's been heard around the world, you know. In I a mean, sense. the cage was like, a, it was just a chain link fence like you put in your backyard. Yeah. And anybody that's ever opened up a chain link fence knows that the, that little chingus that, that closes, yeah. it starts moving side to side. So, you can imagine when Terry Gordy hits his 280 pounds, I mean, go watch it. Oh yeah, I mean that, and you know the, and, and you kind of just hope that that little thing took some of the brunt, even though it still knocked him basically unconscious for a second, probably. You know, it it took some of the brunt. So imagine what it would have been like if it had just been a real, um, a real swing he knocked with the nothing. total shit out of him. Yeah. I mean, it, it that moment that moment was imprinted on on. I mean, it was. It was crazy, and to say that they were going to riot is an understatement. The safest place for Michael Hayes was back in that cage. I bet. I can only imagine. Like I said, I think about that. You know, them walking. Watch them trying to get. Watch them trying to get up that ramp. I mean, going out to that to that um entry to that hallway from just getting from the ring to try to get out get out of the arena. Watch how the crowds on them and the Dallas. Those were armed Dallas police officers doing security. Right. I can't even imagine that there were not more people stabbed wrestlers. I mean, you know, because I can't imagine all those men were not carrying some kind of pocket knife. That was probably just what you did. You know, everybody has a pocket knife and it just, all you had to do is just jerk, you know, jerk your arm out. Like you wouldn't even know they're just coming. Like you said, there's no entryway. There's no, you know, anyway, I get all that. That's y'all's homework this week. Y'all's homework to, to, to see the heat getting out of control is to go, and you can find it on, you don't even have to go to the to Peacock. You can just go on YouTube, right. type in David Von Erich versus Terry Gordy handcuff match and watch right. the heat get out of control. That's the match that Terry Gordy hit that fan before the match even started and knocked him back about two rows. And homeboy didn't even drop his cigarette. It was incredible. That should have. I was one section kind of over and we're like, oh, <laughs> I didn't screw with Terry Gordy, y'all. But That's we were over just you. one section over from that and watch that home, watch it Terry Gordy hit nail that guy. But go watch that match and you watch yes. the heat get out of control. Like I said, a fan ended up in the ring. And when he got in the ring, you could just see that look on his face, like, oh shit, I'm in the ring. <laughs> now what do I do? <laughs> he didn't expect to get all the way in. Oh Lord. I bet there are some other great stories about that for us. It looks like filter free is put up the YouTube. I hope that's what they're sending people to in the chat. <laughs> I hope it's not something oh, else. I, I, oh, I, I, yeah. I put, oh, that I you? Put, I put our show on Filter on filter Freeze oh. feed. Okay, okay, okay. Good. I just wanted to make sure. I was like... Um, they're kind of... We're, 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 we're partners on this StreamYard deal, so they, they, well, they may be... They're starting okay. to broadcast on our channel. We're broadcasting on theirs. Cool. Well, I did know that, but I just... When I saw them pop up, that was my first thought. I was like, oh, they put it up. We got another question? I do. What unlikely opponent did Mike Von Erich face in his debut match in late 1983? Was it his brother Kevin, David Manning, Jim Cornette, or Skandar Akbar? Who was his unlikely opponent in his debut match? Smart, smart fans. Everybody's. You are all correct. It was Skandar. It was the greatness that is Skandar Akbar. Exactly. The hated. He showed, apparently, you know, as a long rival, <laughs> as a uh, longtime rival of the Von Eriks, he said he did not want Mike's first match to be easy, which it wasn't. 
but he did, you know, he was pinned. So he actually, and, and behind the scenes, he actually, he actually asked to be, to be Mike's first opponent. Yes. Cause he thought a lot, he thought an awful lot of Mike and he, he became really good friends with Mike and he wanted to, um, he wanted to take care of him. And that he did. He got to be, he, you know, he was pinned by him. Gave him his first win. So awesome. And Thanksgiving next, night, 1983. Thanksgiving night. That's so cool. I would love to, I wish that was still a thing, going to a show. You know, like going to a wrestling show at Christmas night or Thanksgiving night. I would totally do it. My family would probably hate me, but I would totally do it. It's what we did. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think we'd have a great time. All right, last question. Don't even know why I'm going to ask it because we've talked very, very much about it. May 6, 1984, Kerry Von Erich defeated Nature Boy Ric Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. How long was his world title reign? We got nine days, about six weeks, about three weeks, and of two months. And you all should know this because we've talked about this. If y'all were paying attention. If you were paying attention. And I said it and it wasn't no about. It was exact. Smart, smart guess. There they go. Andrew answered first. He did. That's Andrew, Brandon, T. Weave, Mark Dodd. And Andrew, Andrew even really repeated listening. the 18 defenses in 18 days. That's what I was going to say. He he really got on it. But yes, you all are correct. It is about three weeks. <laughs> he thinks I don't listen. And we all Andrew know and Terry. Andrew and Terry, if you get tired of talking about wrestling, we can talk about you can talk about college football with them. That's true. They have the top T or top T and A. No, that's not right. Oh, geez. What is it called, guys? The T and A. Top 10. TNA, TNA top, top 10. I don't know what the hell it's called, but I listen to it. It's TNA <laughs> top 10. I know. They're probably like. Okay. I gave them crap because they were talking about college rivalries. TNA top 10. Thank you, Terry. That's what Trying I to thought. put it over. I listened to it and. You know, they were talking about, they just happened to mention rivalries, and they talked about Oklahoma, Texas. They talked about the Iron Bowl, yes. Army, Navy. I think they mentioned, they might have mentioned Michigan, Ohio State. I can't remember. I they had a good little. They didn't talk know, about the Egg Bowl, though. The Egg Bowl. There's, only, there's a lot of bowls these days. I did like Well, no, it's talked. not It's not a bowl game. It's in the Iron Bowl is in Alabama between Auburn and right. Auburn and 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 and, and um, Alabama. Right. Roll Tide. And then the Egg Bowl is between Mississippi State and Ole Miss. They call that the Egg Bowl? I guess because both teams both teams crack like eggs. I don't know. Suck like suck an egg. <laughs> but I don't Alabama, know. I didn't Alabama's really the Iron Bowl because iron don't break, baby. Roll oh. tight. I did not. I did like their conversation about the whole why Florida State's not in and all that mess. Because I don't know. Like I listen to them and I try to watch some stuff. And you know, they had a good. They had some good conversations about that because that was a fire. I mean, you talk about people being fired up about something. Oh, Kirk Herbstreit finally said that he he said I'm gonna tell you why Florida State's not in because Alabama's better than them. Uh, Texas is better than them. Washington's better than them. Michigan's better than them. Georgia's better than them. And I think they named one other team, too. Oh. Is I that mean, he just finally that... said that's why they're not in. It's because right. they're not as good. I think Dollar Bill Dave said he hoped he got pink eye in a very oh, unfashionable oh, Dollar Bill way. Dave said a lot. <laughs> that's what I was saying. That's all I'm going to say about what he said about. Um, hey, I'm going to tell you. And. Him. And. The, I read that the attorney general in Florida is going to sue the is going to sue the college football committee, mm. and 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 I don't know. I mean, because they didn't get their participation trophy. But if they need a petition pay, a participation trophy, why not get a belt from Big Time Belts? Big Time Belts can say 
can make your Florida State 13 and 0. We should have been there, belt. You can Stop throw it over it. your shoulder, walk around the state of Florida, and act like a badass. Or you can order belts for your independent promotion, like BIW did with their tag belts, like Battle Zone did with their light heavyweight belt, like SWA did with all their belts. Big time belts can do it for you with high quality and low prices. You can find them on Facebook. Uh, you can uh, you join the group if you have a dream that involves leather and metal big time belts can hook it up for you if you have a fantasy football team fantasy football league give your winner a belt man why would they not want one instead of a trophy or or some kind of stupid bet where they got to do something stupid if they lost or they were the worst or money Look at that fantasy football belt, man. I would, I'd actually pay people to help me win my league if I had that. Or get your, get your granddaughter's team a, a, a softball belt, so when they hit a home run, they get to throw it over their shoulders. The kids love doing that stuff. This guy got a Vegas Golden Knights belt because he's a fan. Bless his heart. The Mississippi Sea Wolves uh, work with Gulf Coast Wrestling, and they had a belt made. And we want to thank Big Time Belts for sponsoring our podcast. Big Time Belts on Facebook. Awesome. I. It'll be interesting to see if they take you up on your recommendation of Florida State getting their own belt. To. Uh, it'll, be, it, it'll be interesting to see if they do that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if they think that is the same. Do you think it, I mean, do people really need to sue? Like, is this really, I mean, I don't know. Is this really a big deal that the attorney general is going to sue? If the attorney general is an elected position, he needs to drop that because, oh, I don't know, though, because those Nimrods are probably rally on that. But I'm sure it, it has to be an elected official, right? I'm just yeah, curious. But I, think, like, I, think, I think the dude from Florida that's running for president's behind that, too. And if he's willing to waste taxpayers' money that way, maybe so, we need to take a good look at him. <laughs> Which one? Aren't there two? Like the Santos and the. That's the guy. Two? He is for. Is he the he, governor? He's the governor, right? Yeah. How did we go to build a political? Show? Why don't we just put a thirty-day <laughs> moratorium on it, and then after Georgia, if if I win the lottery, if I win the lottery, I'm going to offer the coach. Uh, I'm going to offer Kirby Smart five million dollars to hang a hundred on him. If you can hang a hundred on him, I'll give you five million dollars. If I win the lottery. I will blow that kind of money just to see if they'll hang a hundred on Florida State. Interesting. I kind of hope you win. Don't forget your friends. <laughs> well, I do right? too. I do too because I I'd really like to retire. No kidding. But how will people get their the, hot the podcast Gino? would take a the podcast would take a different turn. It would be how did Dave blow a lot of money this week? <laughs> and be like whoever's in our chat, you get a hundred. You get a hundred, right? Now I feel like we're just punch drunk. We're just talking about the we are. random uh, stuff. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna call it a night while we're ahead before I yes before I I've already I just alienated the whole state. Well, you never and know. I should have just gave them some tender sympathy and told them bless their heart. That's right. You could have you could have got sent them a big time belt. I don't know who to the Florida State team. You could have done that, but oh well, maybe next time. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> JB Game said you'd be wearing so much bling. Oh. <laughs> that's hilarious. I think that's funny. Okay. But uh, we want to thank y'all for joining us tonight. We want to again thank David Manning for being so generous with his time. Yeah. That, oh, that was so, so great. I mean, I, I, I could just sit here and just gush for forever over that. It was so much fun to visit with him. Definitely. I want to thank our studio audience for being with us tonight. We want to thank everybody. We want you to, mm -hmm. um, if you're watching this on Facebook or Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, if you're watching it on one of those platforms, please go to our YouTube. Um, you can find us at, um, at pwdpod.com. That'll take you to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe. We're kind of in a lull now. We're being stuck at 256. We're trying to, we're really trying to do something with the, um, we're really trying to do something with our YouTube channel. Help us out, you know, throw us a bone, throw us a freaking bone. That's um, 
and you're going to get uh, cannonballed at 300. So, I mean, we're, we're almost there. Yeah. Vladimir Koloff really wants to give me a cannonball. And, uh, and it's, um, and if you want to support the support the pod by our using by our merch, go to jumpinthepond.com. Jumpinthepond.com for your talking wrestling with Palm Water Dave merch. You can get the logo shirt. You can get the pucker up asshole shirt that's Amy's. You can get the not completely straight shirt that's Justin's. You know, um, and uh, the newest shirt: shut your pirate hooker mouth. That's me. <laughs> so we're gonna work on we're gonna like work to. on that one this week. We need exactly. something new. That's funny. Definitely. So yes, please share, like, subscribe, give us a five star review. You know, we appreciate everybody that joined us tonight. And I think we're a great show. We want you to and we think you think we're a great show. So please share with your friends and let them know how funny we are and what a great time you have. So that they'll come join us whenever we have, uh, when we have our shows streaming live. There we go. <laughs> so for Amy Vaughn, the first lady of the Arn Anderson fan club, I'm Palmwater Dave, and we will see you next week. <laughs>